I'm a feminist, but... Hello, <laughs> Christchurch. Um, I'm a feminist, but tonight, this is the first show of the Australian Aotearoa tour. <laughs> and uh, our tour manager, Kylie, said, what uh, playlist would you like as the audience walking in? And I said, oh, it's one on Spotify. I can't remember the name of it. But the picture is of a very attractive young woman licking a cake that says abortion is health care. <laughs> and I saw the men working in this theatre visibly laugh. <laughs> Just went, yeah, okay, we've got the measure of this show. And then Kylie found it and went, that's Miley Cyrus. <laughs> and I felt really old. I went, no, I know what she looks like. I just don't know what she looks like licking a cake that says abortion is health care. I was distracted by the slogan, which I assume is the point of the... Ca I'm going to stop now. I'm a feminist, but... I agreed to MC a women's fundraising event because I heard they had amazing goodie bags which contained Yves Saint Laurent lipstick, which is a colour that makes me look like I'm in cardiac arrest. <laughs> but I wear it because it's an Yves Saint Laurent lipstick. I get it. Um, what's, what's the name of the charity? I can possibly tell you the name of the charity because I'm still doing some work for them. I also got an eyeshadow that makes me look like I've got cholera. So. Excellent. What a great pairing. I know, like... She's it's... gone into cardiac arrest from the cholera. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm hoping Listen. there's a blusher that's going to make me look like I've got tuberculosis. And then to... I've done a feminist charity gig for less. Yep. And will do again. Uh, if you're listening, uh, both Michelle Acourt and I are happy to come and do your charity gig. Just put something fancy in the gift bag and we are all over it. I'm a feminist, but... I haven't done uh, any laundry of my own in about two months. Because, no, no, it's not that bad. Because my girlfriend did an intervention on me um, about my chaotic laundry style. And so we divided the housework into long hair and short hair jobs. No! No! It's the first night of the tour, Grace. Give us a chance. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I think I'm fired by the guilty feminists for that, aren't I? No, this is why we're here. We're here to share. We're here to exfoliate the shame. That we're... we're here to expose. Ooh. Long hair and short hair. So Long what short does hair. short hair do? Well, <laughs> seems um, I'm not like the old so male hair. female binary, if I'm, if I, if I'm, if I'm honest. Uh, what does short hair do? It doesn't sound good, right? Short hair does the DIY. But, 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 the feminist part is I'm really fucking bad at it, it turns out. I know, I wouldn't have felt so part. either, right? Well, we've set the bar. That's the feminist part tonight, gang. The feminist part is Grace Petrie can't do DIY. Um, I am also very bad at DIY. I don't think I do short hair or long hair jobs in my house. I just say, look, I'm really busy. Like, literally, I'm a feminist, but backstage tonight, as I was putting my shoes on, I realised that my legs needed a wax. Not needed, wanted. And <laughs> it was their choice. Um, and I just said, I've just been working so hard. I said, I can either do the work or do the wax. I can't do both. Sometimes my legs are waxed, sometimes the work is done. It depends on the fucking day of the week. And I realised that wasn't as feminist as it could have been. But listen... If feminism isn't about choice, and it isn't, um, <laughs> it's about power and equality, um, then uh, just leave me alone. I like smooth legs. <laughs> Your legs are fabulous. I'm a feminist, but I recently went to a new doctor. And uh, when I walked in, he looked at me, and he looked at my health records, and he looked at me, and he said, is this date of birth correct? Because you look about... 10 years younger, and I said, <laughs> <laughs> Was he hot? 
Yeah. 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 I hot. had a very hot fertility doctor. Oh, wow. And it would help. Oh, well, <laughs> he was gorgeous. There was something about him. And he happened to be, he just was the guy in my area, but he happened to be like a... In boy. your area. He was in your area. <laughs> he wasn't all up in my area, but he just happened to be like apparently this, you know, this kind of well, very well-known guy. And... Um, one point, I, he said to me, because when I get anxious, my joke rate goes up. Yeah. And at one point, he said, look, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter, you've got plenty of time. And I went, oh, and then he looked down at the chart and he went, oh, my God, you look so young. And then he told us, like, some very bad news about my fertility. But as we walked out the door, I said to my husband, well, the main takeaway from that for me was how young I look. <laughs> and he laughed and Tom laughed. And he said, I, he said, I wish all my patients were like you. Most of them are crying. And you just, just your guy, honestly, those sessions should have come with a two-drink minimum. It's when I get anxious or something's a bit awkward or embarrassing or, you know, I don't know, that's not awkward or embarrassing, but you know what I mean, when something's stressful for you... My way of dealing with it is to somehow become a comedian on a cruise ship. It's just bang, 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 bang. And I think he loved, loved that so much. And I think he felt it was a special show just for him. At one point, he hugged me goodbye and he just went, we're going to get you pregnant. Like that. And I was like, it wasn't wow. sleazy. It wasn't sleazy. I've made it sound sleazy. I've made it sound like he should be arrested. But I swear, it was just a funny moment. And I had set the tone. Don't do that if you're a fertility doctor, by the don't, way. Don't, don't victim blame yourself. It's not because you said the time. It was funny. I've made it worse than it was. It just was a moment that I just laughed. It just made me laugh. It just made me laugh. I did put it in a script. Um, who are we on to? Is it you? You're on to me. Yeah, yeah. You, it's you. Have you done anything unfeminist lately, Grace? Well, I'm a feminist, but um, when I listened to Taylor Swift's most recent uh, 17 song... Uh, album yet again about breakups. <laughs> I did think, babe, maybe it's you. <laughs> you're not thinking at this point, maybe you're doing something. I don't know. Are we ready to start the show? Yeah! Then welcome, welcome, welcome to the Guilty Feminist live in Ototahi. of our tour in Aotearoa and Australia. And here we are live. <laughs> Ototahi, here we are. You are the first step on the tour. How do you feel about that? <laughs> we came to you first because we knew you'd give us a good time. Let's be honest. We wanted to start as so we meant to go on. Um, thank you so much for coming out. We haven't been back here for like two years. Um, and so we really, really appreciate you sticking with us. I, I sort of need to start off by saying, um, I've never done a show in New Zealand without Cal Wilson. Sorry. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. This is just, look, if, she wa if I'm not crying, she's not, she wasn't spe she was special. Do you know what I mean? She was so special. I had a bit of a chat to her before the show and said, I need you with me. And my husband got me this locket, which has a picture of me and Cal inside. And Cal's husband gave me this peg. Now, I don't know... If <laughs> I don't know if you know the story of the peg, um, but one of Cal's I'm a Feminist Butts, we toured a lot together over the years doing the show, and one of her I'm a Feminist Butts was I'm a Feminist Butt, my side quest uh, is the search for the perfect clothes peg. Now, what happened is after that, every show, people brought pegs and said, we think this is the ultimate peg, we think this is the ultimate People sent her pegs to the boats, we think this is the ultimate peg. She had more pegs than any human being in the world. This was the one that she judged to be ultimately the perfect peg. Um, it's, got a, it's got a rainbow hue. It's a bit like a, a paper clip as well. Not a paper clip, like a bulldog clip. So I'm keeping it on my folder so that um, she's with us for the tour. Um, and I just want to say she's... Um, the reason I'm so happy we're starting here is this is Cal's hometown. Um, and it always meant a lot to her coming here, coming back here. Um, and it's, it's, it feels very unfair that I'm here tonight and she isn't. But in some ways, Cal will always be here and always be with us. Um, so if you could keep her in mind tonight um, and feel her energy, um, I feel like she's going to carry us through the show. Thank you. We love you, Cal. <laughs> We have 
got some amazing, amazing guests tonight. Um, you've already seen Michelle A. Court, who's going to be my co-pilot for this evening. It means a lot that Michelle said yes to this because um, she was actually delivering a special book to Cal's parents when she got the call asking if she would co-pilot. Um, and she was a close friend of Cal's, and I feel a very similar kin energy. Cal, uh, Michelle's never done the show before, but she's been to the show when Cal has been there. And so I'm really, really pleased that Michelle's going to co-pilot this evening. Also, you've already seen something from Grace Petrie. Um, all the way from the UK. Um, we've got some absolutely brilliant guests. Um, we have an incredible poet. It's going to be an amazing night. Um, are you on for an amazing night? Yeah. Okay. All right. So first, I want to know a little bit about what you have been doing, Christchurch, since I saw you last. So um, just give us a cheer if you are doing anything feminist. Woo. Excellent. All right. Um, I heard a big woe from over there. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Eve. Uh, as part of my work, I launched a campaign to end sexual violence in Aotearoa last month. Oh, wow. <laughs> what is that campaign? Um, you can find it at stopit.nz. Stopit.nz. Um, or you can also go to our Instagram page, which is Violence Free Aotearoa. Um, and it's got resources, it breaks down the complexity of sexual violence, it's got some tips for being an upstander, which is the opposite of a bystander. Oh. Yeah, there you go. So, stopit.nz. Stopit.nz. Everybody has to remember that. Spread it, share it, go to it. Do you want people to donate or just be informed? Um, well, I did just get declined for a grant application to make a series of educational videos, so... <laughs> I wouldn't mind 20 grand for that. <laughs> we'll pass the hat around. Does anybody have 20 grand for a really good cause? Or even if you've got $20, that, that'll be good. Is there somewhere we can donate on the website? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, web, the, the, um, the charity is called Aviva, not the um, insurance company. Uh, <laughs> it's aviva.org.nz and we're a family and sexual violence charity. Amazing, amazing. Well done. What's your name? Eve. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> now, I know what some of you were thinking. Some of you were thinking, Eve, coincidentally the name of the first woman, um, <laughs> has set the bar too high. <laughs> Others are thinking, oh, I was going to say that uh, I, I had a word with HR about how there were too few women on a particular project that I was doing and they did nothing about it but I still felt good about myself um, what Eve's done is she set the bar so high people are going oh I haven't set up any national campaign <laughs> with a series of currently unfunded videos that we know full well will be funded because it's Eve she gets shit done listen she didn't do you know what I did a mushroom trip Eve once this is relevant it wasn't really a trip, it was an experience. It was under, it was under, it was like with a therapist and you go really, really deep. That's your New Year's resolution. <laughs> what a great New Year's resolution. <laughs> Mushrooms. No, seriously, some, listen, don't do kids, stay in school. Don't do psychedelics until your brain is very fully formed and then only with a proper shaman and or therapist. Seriously, it's very important that you don't just go off willy-nilly just randomly, but I had an extraordinary experience where um, somebody said to me, um, oh, I could never do um, mushrooms because um, I'm scared of snakes. And I went, why would that matter? And she said, because I would see snakes. I would think they were real and I'd freak out. Um, anyway, I was like, oh, I wish you hadn't said that because I'm doing them on Saturday. And now all I can think of is snakes. Honestly, I had an intrusive thoughts about snakes literally every hour. On the, I was like, why would anyone say that? Why would anyone say that? And I just imagine, I was thinking, oh my God, there's going to be snakes. And because of the thing, I think I'm training my brain now to think of snakes. Anyway, I had this extraordinary experience. I saw all of these things. I felt, you know, personal things in big, you know, life, death, all sorts. And I had an incredible time. And then right at the end, I felt I was coming out of it. And suddenly, this snake came, <laughs> like here. And it winked at me. <laughs> 
And then it looked to its right, and there was Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the snake looked back and said, I'm a woman. Of course I'm a woman. Um, of course. And now he's made a mistake. He's made another one of us. And we're going to team up and get out of here. And the snake said, you know I'm a woman because my whole body is one finger up to the power. <laughs> and then the snake whispered to Eve and said, he's told us how to get out of here. He's told us if we rebel, he'll throw us out. And then they went off together and I thought, oh my God, I have just seen the very first act of feminism. <laughs> Isn't that extraordinary? I told that story in a live show that has not yet been recorded and women were coming to the show a second time with a snake tattoo of, and right, the last line of the show is, make your whole body one finger up to the power. I never told another guilty feminist because I didn't want to blow it, but I just had to because Eve is right there. And I feel like it was so connected. Um, anybody else doing anything? Because we let's start on lower bar, lower bar, because Eve's doing something so remarkable. Has anyone done a very small act of feminism? Like, you know, uh, not give up bras for the, uh, for the pandemic and, and not take them up again for a couple of months, something like that. You've, you've got a small one? You let your armpit hair grow out. So have I, but it's just because I forgot to bring a razor on tour. <laughs> I'm dying to... Are you, are you enjoying it being grown out? Yeah. You're enjoying it? Yeah. yeah. Are you keeping it that way? Uh, sometimes no. Sometimes no. <laughs> yeah. That's a very small act of feminism, isn't it? The thing is, when young... When really young people, really young, cool people, like Sophie Duker, she grows her armpit hair out and dyes it green and stuff. But when she does it, it looks like an act of punk. If I do it, people just think, oh, she's let herself go. And that's the difference. I can't get away with that shit. Maybe I could. Maybe I could. But I'm not going to be at the vanguard of that. I'm doing other things. Somebody else could be first to grow their armpit hair out. Although, having said that, if you saw it now, it's fine. It's fine. I'm wearing long sleeves. It's Christchurch. Nobody thought for one minute it would be warm enough in this frankly ski field of a town <laughs> to show any body hair what so fucking ever um okay great so that's a low bar now thank you very much for providing that low bar other people feel encouraged now anybody got an act of feminism better than growing their armpit hair out but probably not yes over here hello yes hi i'm going to direct a musical <gasps> about alison bechdel's life Oh. Now, does everyone here know the Bechdel test? Yes. yes. Does anyone not know the Bechdel test? Some days my life doesn't even pass the Bechdel test. Um, it's, if you're watching a movie, the test is, are there two female characters, both with names, one cannot be Hot Mom or you know, Waitress 2. Um, they have to have names. And do they have a conversation about something other than a man? And so few movies pass it, it's very frightening. Uh, about half of movies don't pass it. They're just, you know, they're not particularly blokey movies. They're just random, you know, it's a movie. It's a rom-com or a, you know, a spy story or something. They don't pass it. And so Alison Bechdel made this test. She's been on The Guilty Feminist. She was on The Guilty Feminist for International Women's Day in lockdown. Tell me, what is this musical? Is it, it is, Fun Home? It, it is Fun Home. Amazing. It is based on the graphic novel about her life and her relationship with her father. And uh, it's going to be opening on August 10th at the Court Theatre. And it's going to be really good. August 10th at the Court Theatre. Everybody here... Do you know why everybody here has to buy a ticket for that and bring somebody who wouldn't otherwise go? It's because if you don't go, they go, mm, feminist musicals don't work, and you don't get any more. You are punished with scarcity. So everyone's got to go, bring their friends, go on social media, they think, oh, this feminist musical thing, this really is a, you're taking off, let's do another one. And then they'll write another one because there isn't a second. Um, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, somebody emailed me just before the show and said they were a firefighter and would be in the audience tonight. Where is that firefighter? <gasps> Hi. Please tell us firefighter stuff. <laughs> Sorry, is this unconsensual audience participation? I thought you emailed me because you wanted to talk about it. Oh, I did. I just didn't realise you'd actually read that. Oh. Um, <laughs> what's your name? Helen. Helen. Yeah. 
Excellent. So, Helen, you are a firefighter. In Christchurch. Yeah. In Christchurch, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, if there is a fire, Helen could come to your door and rescue you. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, my God. Do you say rescue, or is that not now an inclusive language? <laughs> No, no. It sounds um, a bit patriarchal, but if, in this situation, I think it's actual. It's a bit like when someone says, oh, he's mansplaining. I'm like, he is explaining. You asked him. Um, <laughs> that's, it's not mansplaining unless you already know it or you haven't asked. And he's here. It's, sometimes it is rescuing, and that is when you're, I'm on fire. Yeah, you're I, not. I, I will You're trained to you. put me out. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I'm trained to rescue anyone here, yes. Trained to rescue anyone here. M- man or woman. Anyone here? Only people in Christchurch. Uh, but so, if for the duration, I'm only here till tomorrow. So hopefully, nothing will happen. I won't burst into flames. But uh, if I did, it would be Helen to the rescue. Um, and how many female firefighters are there? What's the percentage of female firefighters? Um, the, so there's eight of us in Christchurch. How of how many? Um, two, round about 200 firefighters. 200 firefighters and eight women currently. Um, like career firefighters, so volunteers on the outskirts of the city are there is a slightly higher percentage for them. Okay, but professionals. Mm-hmm. Okay, volunteer. I think I'd rather have a professional. It, can, when you ring up, can you say, <laughs> I'm, "I'm delighted there are volunteers, and I want more volunteers." And don't, if you are volunteering, don't stop. But I feel like well, it depends on the fire, though, doesn't it? If it's like my waste paper basket's based on flames, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm doing it right. Oh no, I've accidentally poured wine on it. I'd wait, send a volunteer. I think it's under control. <laughs> If I, was, if I was on the top of a building, I'd probably go, could you send one of the pros? In fact, is Helen there? Is Helen working tonight? <laughs> It'd be like that. Would it be like that? Well, yeah, except I'm here tonight, so I'd probably ask for, for one of the others. <laughs> oh, she's not... If this building catches on fire, she's on a fucking night off, all right? <laughs> she's, put on, she's got a lovely frock on. She's not putting you out tonight. Uh, that would be up to somebody else. Um, and is there anything you can tell us about encouraging more women into firefighting or anything, any feminist issue. I shouldn't say it like that. Are there any feminist issues in firefighting you would like to tell us about? I, I mean, it's how long is a piece of string right now? But it's, about, <laughs> it's about one minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the biggest thing, I think, for us and for me is that um, when you're raising little girls, you don't just tell the boys that they can be firefighters, mm. you can tell the girls too. Because, uh, and can, do you visit schools and tell girls? Oh, yourself? absolutely. Because there, there's nothing better than seeing it. You know, you can hear about it, you can go, really? Um, but when you see it, you're like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so do you visit, you said you visit schools. What else do you do to outreach? Probably just turning up to fires. If I was a little girl <laughs> and then you turned up to fire, I'd think, oh, this is a job for me. I mean, it probably wouldn't be my first thought. My first thought would be save, save my teddy. But after that... I'd be like, I could do this too. And it'd probably make me want to do it, actually, if you saved me. Yeah. Any other feminist issues? <laughs> um, well, the, being like, the men in the room right now would feel a lot like what it feels like to be at work every day. So just... Oh, she's good. <laughs> she's good. One thing I notice is if I do like a corporate where it's a women's event, you know, it's a diversity and inclusion event, and there's usually a couple of men there, and sometimes there's a senior stakeholder, that's what they say in the corporate world, which just means a boss, um, and he comes out and goes, well, we think women are very important, diversity and inclusion is very important, and we're here to sponsor the event, blah, blah, blah. And I've never been to one where that man hasn't gone, oh, I feel quite outnumbered. <laughs> oh, dear, I'm sorry. I feel like my dad might say the wrong thing. <laughs> and, like, and I always say, after he speaks and I take over because I'm hosting the thing, I always go, imagine if every time we walked into a room of men in a professional context, we went, oh, not a lot of men here. <laughs> I don't know how I'll cope. I don't know how I'll survive. It's going to be very awkward for all of us. <laughs> they would just stare at you like you're insane. <laughs> And I always reassure that man, as weird as it is for you to be in a room full of women, it's just as weird for us. <laughs> We're always in a room full of men as well in these professional contexts. Um, so thank you so much, Helen. This is a fantastic, fantastic piece. And can I ask you, next time we're in Christchurch, would you come on and be a guest and tell us more about being a firefighter? <laughs> she just said maybe. Um, and I admire that. She's not going to be coerced just because she's in public. She's a fucking firefighter. And she'll say she'll do it when she's goddamn good and ready. 
I love that. Helen, everybody. All right. Um, it's time to start the show. Please welcome to the stage my incredible co-pilot for this evening. I'm so honored to have her. It's Michelle A. Court. <laughs> Fabulous. I love Helen. She's, she rocks. We all love Helen a little bit. Yeah. Helen, are you currently single? <laughs> are you not? Oh, disappointing for everyone, yeah. and I do mean literally everyone. A lot of relationships don't work out, though. <laughs> <laughs> are you here with your partner? Yeah, he's next to me. He's next to you. Oh, yeah. I see him. Oh. He, <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't know what? He doesn't know what he's at. He doesn't know what he's at. Oh, I probably should have said that. Yeah, I normally do, but I got, I got carried away with other stuff about mushrooms and snakes. Um, it's a podcast. What's his name, Helen? Josh. 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 But we'll call him Mrs. Hennon. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Firefighter. Um, Mr., Mr., Mr. Helen Firefighter is really what... We what do you him. do, Josh? I think it's not Matt. <laughs> In comparison, with oh, in comparison, sure, nobody does as much as Helen. I no, mean, he Helen's could be, literally he saving could lives. Be. Josh, are you also a firefighter? No. 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 What, what do you do, Josh? Uh, engineering. Engineering. Yeah, yeah, whatever. So you, <laughs> so you build the buildings that catch fire. <laughs> that your wife has to get. Is it wife? Are you married? Yes. Yeah. You are married. Yeah. That's that's really locked down. Um, <laughs> That your wife has to get out of bed to put out because you haven't built them sufficiently <laughs> fireworthy enough. Is that the case, Josh? I put it to you, Josh, that you get up in the morning and make work for your wife. <laughs> no, Josh, thanks for coming. Listen, this is a podcast, and that is radio that nobody stops you making. This is being recorded. So, Josh, when you're listening to this at home, which you will be because you want to, you know, you obviously want to hear Helen, um, you will hear your own laugh should you do one. <laughs> Have you laughed yet, Josh? Yes. You have laughed. We're winning, Josh. Over. I what you... When you listen to this back, you'll be able to hear yourself squirm as well. Oh, <laughs> poor Josh! Josh, Josh, Josh. We're so happy you've come. And also, if you are someone like Josh. <laughs> any Josh in the audience is welcome. Any, any Josh of Helen's is a Josh of mine. <laughs> and, and listen... Michelle is clearly a bit jealous of you, Josh. Yeah, I am. You have yeah. direct competition now, yeah. but that will keep you on your toes, Josh. Mm -hmm. Watch yourself. <laughs> so far, out of five, what would you give the show, Josh? Five. Five. Correct. That correct. is correct. Yes. Josh is very keen to get the answers right and <laughs> is feeling a, a little unstable. No, Josh, thank you so much for coming and uh, supporting Helen tonight. And also, oh, I mean, I say supporting Helen. She didn't know she was on. Um, but thank you so much for coming. And, uh, and, and I hope you enjoy the show. You're sitting in the front row, and that tells me that Helen wants you to learn something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> poor Josh. Poor Josh. Poor Josh. Poor Josh. What a good sort, though. What a good sort. Round of applause for Josh. Round of applause for Josh. Um, Michelle, now listen, you were meant to do the show in Auckland years ago, I but was. on the night, this is a true story, on the night, we got a call, Michelle can't come, her daughter has gone into labour, she's about to become a grandmother, the second time? The second time. The second time, yeah. and she needs to be at the hospital, and I was like, if there's ever been a more feminist reason for missing a show... Your daughter going into labour is... I mean, it's up there, isn't it? I felt terrible about it, but, but I also just had to be there because the situation had been with my... This was my grandson, Luku Tafati, who was born six years ago, but... Was that six years ago? So yeah. So the girl's was quite new. Yeah. So we must have come to New Zealand quite early. I think so. Yeah. And, yeah, it was a brand-new-ish thing that I knew about and was tremendously excited about but and then missed out on doing it. But I knew I had to go and be there because... Uh, I had arrived late to my granddaughter's birth 10 years ago. Um, she was in Australia, I was in New Zealand. I, I, took, I had to catch three planes to get there, and she, my daughter went into labour. It's a very long story. On the way over, I won't tell you the whole thing. Anyway, I got stuck. I got, I got to 
Coonawarra, wherever it was, somewhere in Australia, unpronounceable, and um, got stuck in the lift and um, had to claw my way out. Helen, you should have been there to help. <laughs> um, and finally got upstairs. And the, the deal was that my granddaughter refused to be born until I arrived. She got stuck. She was around the wrong way. And when I walked in, she suddenly went, whoa, and out she came. It was, it was amazing. It was magic. It was a miracle. Wow. And so Holly needed me to be there for Nuku, so that because yes. otherwise so, he'd still probably be inside her. <laughs> and he's quite tall, and it would have been uncomfortable. It feels like a Netflix movie that you're stuck in a lift and trying to be birthed out of the lift with the jaws of life as she's trying to... It feels like an episode of Friends or something. You know when Joey Tribbiani got yes. the kidney stones, he had to birth the kidney stones as yes. Phoebe was giving birth. It sounds a lot like it's a, a lot made like up that. story, if, yes. but it's not. No, it's a true, a true story. It was the most extraordinary couple of days of my life trying to get there in time for the baby to be born. But she literally, you know, flipped and popped out. Oh. Didn't feel like that. Who's given birth? It doesn't feel like flip and pop out. Give us a cheer if you've given birth. <laughs> God, yeah. fewer than I would have thought. Give us, give us a cheer if you haven't given birth. <laughs> Oh, see, they can they can make that noise without any. <laughs> they don't have to wipe that up. They. They're also out, you know, of the house. Yes. You know, true. and they've they've not got anybody going. You know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you know, sandwiches. there's sandwiches. Yeah. Mum made me sandwiches. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, it. yeah. I know. That's not your impersonation of a child. That is what I think parenting is. is making is sandwiches. Making sandwiches. Is it nine tenths making sandwiches? I don't know. I'm not a parent. Is I it nine know. tenths making sandwiches? It's a You've little bit it. making sandwiches, and it's a lot just picking them up off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Honestly, we've had some trouble in New Zealand with bu- having building supplies, and I keep going because my grandchildren come to stay all the time, and they have wheat bix with milk for breakfast. And honestly, they don't need. We don't need concrete. We don't need asphalt. Just wheat bix and milk. Scraping that off the carpet and curtains at my place, you, honestly, you could build, you, engineer, you could construct something out of wheat bix and milk, surely. You, engineer? Did we not? We've covered his name as Josh, surely. Oh, did it's it Josh? I I, I we said it about forget. 27 times. It's Josh, isn't it? I've st- I just think of him as Mrs. Helen. Mr. Helen. Sorry, Mr. Helen Mr. 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 Um, Yeah, indeed. Um, have you, would you say you've had a feminist week or a guilty week? Or, or are you more guilty or more feminist, I suppose? Oh, I think I might have had a bit of a feminist week. Yesterday, I did one of my favourite things, which is I uh, work with a group of... Um, uh, it's an, a voluntary group, so they're nurses, and their focus is moving and handling people. They deal with people in aged care often, and they uh, are often injured. So they have built this group themselves to learn how to move and handle people without injuring their own bodies. And, how, and they also lobby their employers, the, you know, the hospitals and whatnot, to, um, to give them proper training and equipment so that they can move people around without getting wow. broken. Yeah. Wow. An engineer would probably be quite handy for that too. Yes. So there's a lot of work for you, Josh. That is a truly, truly feminist week. Can you give us a cheer if you think overall you're more feminist than guilty? Give us, a cheer, give us a cheer if overall you're more guilty than feminist. Oh, this is so feminist, I think. I feel a like, lot of people just I are too like frightened the... now to make any kind of sound at all. Yeah. Just give us, why did most people abstain? I've never had an audience abstain from that. And so far, you've been a rocking good audience. So far, I feel like, oh, they've come to play. But on this one question, they've gone, we, we abstain. <laughs> give us a cheer if you're more guilty than feminist. Give us a cheer if you're more feminist than guilty. This is a more feminist than guilty audience. But do you know what? I can always tell the feminist ones and the guilty ones in the foyer. How? There's just a look. (laughs) There's an energy. There's a way of life. It seeps out. But what I'm going to give for my challenge is that in the interval, try and meet somebody who lives locally that you can connect with, do something with, start a WhatsApp group with, or, you know, they might have a project you can work on. Go up and ask about Fun Home, what, how it's going, if they need any volunteers or, you know, people to, you know, do social media marketing or anything like that. Try and get involved with somebody else. After, during the interval, you're obviously going to make some new friends and, you know, hatch some feminist plans. I, when, when a group of uh, feminists come together, I usually call it a coven. So if you could start a little coven during the interval, that would be great. And uh, maybe tell us uh, what, what your coven was afterwards. We'd love to hear about it. 
After the interval, we're going to go deep dive conversation. We've got two incredible guests. We've got Sue Kedgley, who is a New Zealand feminist icon, who was doing women's liberation in the 70s, and she has got so many incredible stories. And we've also got the incredible Anka Richter. Anka is a cult expert, and some people know I was in a cult when I was younger. Um, just give us a cheer if you're in the same cult as me. <laughs> There's always extra hopes witnesses in my audience. Any extra hopes witnesses in? No. Okay, none of them came. Um, <laughs> they know, I put something about cult. I put that we were doing cults on the Facebook group, and I thought, oh my God, they'll all be here. Actually, interestingly, with Jehovah's Witnesses, when you want them to come, they stay home. Um, <laughs> it's not, not. I mean, they're extra Jehovah's Witnesses, probably they've been out too much. Um, uh, so uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to deep dive talk about feminism specifically in Aotearoa. Um, am I saying that correctly? Okay, I'm trying so hard. So, so you, you, you should, don't say it in such a discouraging way. Like, no. Like, you don't think I can do any better. <laughs> say, no, it's like this, like an, an upbeat no. Like, no, we're here to help, teach, aid, encourage. Not like, oh. Don't bother. <laughs> Just don't fucking bother. That's what that noise said. <laughs> Just say New Zealand. We appreciate you trying. We appreciate you trying. That's such a guilty moment <laughs> heckle. We appreciate the effort. Um, can you say it for me? Aotearoa. Aotearoa. Is that better? Aotearoa. Okay, great. Thank you. That, that was it. They, see, I could do better. Um, uh, what was I saying? Aotearoa. Yeah, but in what context was I saying? That's <laughs> fucking key. Um, so we're going to have some deep dive conversation afterwards about really good feminist things um, after the interval. And if all else fails, ask Josh the engineer to buy you a drink. <laughs> he's got money, he's an engineer, and he wants to be more feminist. He's, he's looking, and how can you be more feminist than by buying women drinks? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but like buying the whole room full of people drinks would be the most feminist thing you could possibly most like, feminist just thing. shout the bar. Most feminist thing you could do is just buy this theatre around. Yeah. Feminists are tired, feminists work hard, they need a night out. This night is all about recharging your batteries, feeling joy, so that you can go out there and fight the fight again. If there's any men in this room that would like... Now I'm asking men to go up to women and say, can I buy you a drink? Yeah. I think I've <laughs> created a hit-on-you culture in yeah. the interval of my own feminist show. Yeah. I might be wheeling this back. Could we flip it? And so uh, the women in the room just need to go to the men here and just go, I'll have a Chardonnay. I feel... <laughs> you can certainly try it. But don't coerce anybody just because there are legal issues. Take a second and think back to the sex education you had in school. Did it prepare you to have a healthy and happy relationship with sex and identity? If it was anything like mine, it was stigmatizing, judgmental, and totally unhelpful. But not to worry. The experts are here to offer the sex ed we wish we had. Welcome to Sex Ed with DB. We're a feminist podcast and multimedia platform bringing you all the sex ed you never got through unique and entertaining storytelling, centering LGBTQ and BIPOC experts. We cover an array of sex education topics like abortion, period management, sex and disability, pleasure, reproductive justice, healthy relationships, BDSM, birth control, sex in the media, and so much more. We believe that everyone deserves comprehensive, inclusive, pleasure-centered, medically accurate sex education. Follow along with us as we revolutionize the way we talk about sex and tune into Sex Ed with DB wherever you get your podcasts. Would you like to hear some stand-up comedy? Then please, welcome to the mic, the incredible Michelle A. Court! Hey. Oh, also, Tahi, how fabulous to be here with you. Look, I want to, um, I want to tell you how much I love social media. Bear with me. Uh, because I think it stops you getting too up yourself. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're walking along and thinking, I'm probably doing okay and I'm an alright person. And then you send out a tweet and you find out that you're quite shit. 
and I think that's good for us. Just in this week, I have on Twitter, X, I like to call it X, I think it fits, if you know, it's just full of anger and disappointment like that guy. Um, <laughs> I put out a tweet, and so far this week, I have been described as a menopausal old hag, <laughs> uh, a bitter old cat lady, <laughs> aspirational. <laughs> And an absolute man-hating bitch. Uh, and that's not entirely accurate. It's not men. It's just the patriarchy. But this is just because I posted my Wordle scores. <laughs> to be fair, I get a lot of threes. And that's one of the things that really pisses off men. I mean the patriarchy. So... What, I really, what bothers me about it, though, is that this is just some kind of distraction from the real stuff that we should be putting our energy into, right? They're just trying to distract us away from the stuff that really matters. And for me, the big thing that really matters is climate change. Um, and I know we just, yes, we've got to lobby our governments and corporations to just um, do everything that they possibly can. I get excited about some of the new things that the engineers like uh, Josh are coming up with, like, you know, for example, um, electric planes. Apparently, in some parts of the world, you can do short-haul flights on electric planes. This is a very exciting thing. They can't do long-haul yet, because no one can find an extension cord <laughs> quite long enough for the long haul. And I do what I can at home, and I appreciate that what we do individually isn't going to be enough. What we really have to do is get the governments and corporations to do stuff, but it helps if we do our bit as well. So at home, I do a lot. I, um, I do a lot of recycling. I recycle paper, plastic, glass. I recycle um, a lot of clothing. A lot of what ends up in landfill is perfectly good clothing that people just don't want to wear anymore. So when you see somebody like Josh wearing an old shirt like that, <laughs> the correct thing to say to Josh is, thank you. <laughs> thank you for caring so much about the planet that you're prepared to wear that old shirt. Just... <laughs> forever and ever. I think that's really kind of you. I, uh, what else? I, um, I have recycled two husbands. <laughs> that's just a fancy way of saying I chuck them out. And someone else found a use for them. <laughs> Which really surprised me because they were rubbish. <laughs> it just shows you one woman's trash is another woman's treasure. I was going to compost them. <laughs> but someone explained the carbon emissions involved in that so I just kicked them to the curb and <laughs> after a little while they went there it's just delightful has anyone else um, anyone else been through a divorce? anybody? anybody? Yeah, 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 yeah I mean it's okay right I mean the rest of you probably will just, just, just to be <laughs> but I think it, divorce is okay right I, I mean you know I think you can learn a lot about yourself you can grow as a human obviously obviously divorce isn't the ideal scenario and clearly it's better if they die but, <laughs> can't have everything the way you want it sometimes you just got to make lemonade so so climate change is a big one for me the other thing the other thing that you know we really need to get to work on is the, the wage gap the pay gap for men and women in New Zealand the wage gap between men and women is 12%. What that means is that on average over a lifetime, women earn 12% less than men do, and it's very similar in the UK and Australia. Of course, for Indigenous women, for Māori and Pacifica women, the pay gap is more like 20%. And it's crazy, right? It's absolutely crazy. So this is what we need to do. We need to close that wage gap between men and women and between um, Pākehā and Polynesian and, and Māori. Um, one of the ways that I think we should do that, seeing we're getting paid, ladies, 12% less, is um, we should just do 12% less. Yeah. yeah? I'll walk you through it. If you're working a 40-hour week for 4.8 hours a week, I want you to drift off. <laughs> just do nothing. You're not getting paid for that, but don't do it. <laughs> just stare into space. No one will notice. If they do, they'll say, what are you doing? You say, I'm having my lady time. <laughs> That'll confuse them. They think that happens once a month. <laughs> it's once a week, ladies. It's once a week. If your job involves answering the phone, I want you to only answer the phone 8.8 .8 times out of every 10 that it rings. Just, just start your day with, fuck off. <laughs> 
Kia ora. If your job <laughs> involves emails, everybody's job involves emails, I want you, sisters, I want you to delete 12 emails out of every 100 without reading them. <laughs> Nothing bad will happen. I've been doing that for a year. If they really want you, they will phone. Eventually you will answer. <laughs> Fuck off. Here's my favourite. If your job involves filing, alphabetising of any kind, sisters, I want you to choose for yourselves three letters of the alphabet <laughs> that you will have nothing to do with. <laughs> I'm not getting paid for that, but don't do it. Take the problem home. This is how we have affected social change throughout human history, is you make the political personal, right? So at home, sisters, if you're cooking dinner, don't cook one of the vegetables properly. <laughs> if anyone says, the potatoes are a bit hard, you say, yes. Yes, they are. It's a political statement. <laughs> If you are ironing his shirt, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> don't know how to help you because I don't know who you are. That's really weird. But if you were doing it for a treat, just don't iron the sleeves. <laughs> if you've got three children, <laughs> I want you to ignore one of them 25% of the time. That's not that hard. Those of you who have got three children, think about it, think about it. Think of your three children. You don't have a favourite child, do you? You've got one you can't stand. <laughs> Make it that one. <laughs> this is how we get pay equity by Christmas, sisters. If you are in a straight relationship, and things get a little bit frisky in the bedroom, stop at 88%. <laughs> it's the last 12% they really like. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Michelle Aikor. Thank you, good night. than when you came in. Yes. Excellent. Are you feeling slightly more guilty as well? Yes. The dream. Okay, uh, the next guest is a New Zealand-born Samoan poet whose work is deeply rooted in her ancestry and her role as a tulafale or orator chief. She explores what it means to sustain and construct her identity as a product of the Samoan diaspora. She has also represented Canterbury in rugby. Woo! Put your hands together and make incredible guilty members welcoming woohooing noises for the wonderful Daisy Loviatimo. I acknowledge mana whenua ngai tuahuriri uh, and mana whenua, tangata whenua that sovereignty was never ceded and stand with you um, in your tino rangatiratanga and mana motuhake. How blessed are we that we are to your kaitiakitanga that we are able to call Aotearoa home. Uh, <laughs> to lolo tu, to lolo tautala. Christchurch, thank you for the very warm welcome. Let's give it up again for our guilty feminist. I'm going to share one piece uh, to really honour this kaupapa around uh, exploring my Samoan culture and share a piece around getting my traditional Samoan tattoo. Now, they're done with a hammer and a chisel. Uh, and 
for our women. It's called malu, which is the diamond motif, which is at the back of our legs. Can everyone say malu? Malu. Awesome. It's very ornate, so you can see a lot of skin, not as detailed as our men. Uh, if you've seen a Samoan men's tattoo, it's called bea, which literally translates to the flying bat. Uh, very uh, detailed and black. So can you say bea? Bea. Awesome. And so before I do that, I wonder if I can invite you just to kind of engage in a little bit of a thing that we do just to mafana, make the space warm in our Samoan culture. So if you can pop your hands together like so and just rub it together, which is mili. And then I say mili and I say batia, which is one clap. Batia, batia. Then I say lua bati, which is two claps. Lua bati, lua bati. Then we have to be a little bit more coordinated and I'll say tolu tolu fa, which is... Let's try that. Tol tol fa. Awesome. And then we do call and response, and I'll say hey hey, and you say ho. Hey hey. Ho. Hey hey. Ho. Actually, I'll say guilty, you say feminist. Guilty. Feminist. Guilty. Feminist. Awesome. And because we're still my fana from before, I'm going to say tangi mele taiga, and you're going to do these big actions because we always 10x our actions and our voices so that we can be heard. And please bring all the sound effects so we can warm up the stage for our awesome speakers that are coming up. Tangi mele taika! That's like pussycat vibes. <laughs> Let's try that again. Tangi mele taika! <laughs> yes. And I don't know why Sam wants to do this because we don't have any on the homeland. But I'll say Tangi mele buffalo and everyone's going to go, ooh. Let's try that. Tangi mele buffalo. Ooh. Nice. And last one, Tangi mele snake and everyone's going to be like, for all you cool cats out there, tangi mele snake. Let's take that from the top. Mili, 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 mili. Batia, batia. Lua bati, lua bati. Tosulfa. Tangi mele taika. Tangi mele buffalo. Tangi mele snake. When I say guilty, you say guilty, guilty. And ow, chisel has bitten my skin. And as black marks tell this tale of Siamese demigods singing. Eta ta o fa fi ne aile, ta ta o ta ne. Only the woman, only the woman get the detailed tattoo. But diving for enchanted treasures, the gods, they messed the lyrics up and they came up singing. Eta ta o ta ne aile, ta ta o Fafine, only the men, only the men get the better tattoo. I sit with my 10 yards of material, pour more cigarettes and bottles of vodka encased in their duty-free packaging. My game face is sacky and I'm expiring, I mean I'm perspiring just a little. This is it. There is no turning back. The tufonga, the tattooist, he walks in with the swagger of a lead actor, takes out his Hollywood kit and lays out his outza chisels. Are you ready? He says. Handy him the duty-free gifts, I nod. You see, Sulu Ape is Taika Waititi. Three in one, actor, director, producer, motifs etched in his brilliant mind, all he draws on my thighs are three lines, middle, left, right. Breathe in and hold, he says, and as I breathe in his support actors, they stretch my skin. Taika Waititi, Sulu Ape, he picks up his hammer and his chisel and he tap, tap, taps black lines all the way down. He tap, tap, taps black lines all the way down. <sighs> the support actors wipe my blood with a damp muslin cloth. I breathe in sky and he tap, tap, taps Fetu stars and Momo seagulls. I breathe in sea. And he tap, tap, taps alu-alu jellyfish and ave al starfish. I breathe in land. And he tap, tap, taps angufe worms and goluse crosses. The vi'ali and the centipedes, they crawl down the backs of my legs. And they denote service, servant leadership, tautua, service of the past, of the future, of the untitled aina, church, Village, nation, world. It's all lot, they said. See, I have not yet met the woman I am becoming, but I know that she, 
She stands on the shoulders of giants. She is the rib cages of Nafanua warriors. She has the DNA of Salamasina queens. She is the daughter of the great, 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 great grandmothers of the Falelua or Ainga Malofie, who in Tata was threatened with distinction, with extinction by colonialism. She, she drank some kava, she played some gangster music, she stood with her tani, and she fought for these defiant texts, scripts, and testimonies of nationalism and beauty. It's all or lots of they said, and as he. My kneecaps, I understand why. Because if I can handle this, girl, I can handle anything. There is no turning back. I have made that sacred covenant between being Samoan and living Samoan. I am Malu, protector. I am Malu, shade. I am Malu, shield. I am Malu. Diamond. I am Malu, security. I am Malu, carrier of Nafa genealogy. I am Malu, warrior. I am Malu, woman. I am Malu, I am Malu, I am Malu. Orela eyol kama kai Samoa. The adorning of a Samoan queen. Kia ora. more of you. Um, that piece here is available on the TEDx channel on YouTube and um, I do a lot of live stuff so I think on my Instagram handle is Daisy Speaks. I'll probably post a lot of stuff there. Daisy Speaks. Can, have you, uh, do you have any books of poetry? Uh, it's in the mix. It's in the mix? Yes. Okay well please let us know. Um, we'll put this in the show notes but if you if, you, if your book comes out or anything comes out and you want to come on the show again, we can have you on as a, as a, on a, a we can, if we're back in London, we can have you on a Zoom as a culture app or something like that. So can you please stay in touch? Is there anything else that you want us to know before you leave the stage? Oh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I will be in touch when it does drop. I think I'd just love to share that um, shout out to the Word Christchurch team um, as part of the Word Christchurch Festival. We're in our fourth year now of uh, running Confluence, which is an indigenous platform uh, as part of their... Um, show of Māori and Pacific Poets, and also to Action Education. I'm privileged to be a coach of a local girls, uh, Christchurch Girls High School. It's the second year of uh, an inter high school poetry slam. We won last year, so it's going to be really tough this yes. year to come back to back, but it's an incredible privilege to work with young people to kind of use poetry as a way to hear their voices on what it means to be a young person, especially at Girls High, a young wahine toa, um, and what that means for them to grow up as a young person in Ototahi, but also their dreams and aspirations as a young person in the context of their whānau and community. Thank you again for tonight. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Daisy Nabiotito. I am so proud to present uh, an act with whom I now dare not leave the UK because I know if I come on my own, everyone will go, oh, it's not as good. Um, some of you have probably come especially to see her, because there's something about Aotearoa. Thank you. Um, and the people in it that have particularly taken this next act to uh, their hearts. Um, she is uh, a protest singer. She is a folk singer. She is, I would say, something of a queer rights icon. And she is a Leicester legend. Put your hands together and make incredible woohooing noises for the wonderful Grace Petrie! Hello, Christchurch! It's lovely to be back. Um, yes, I am a process seer. That's what I do. Um, I've been doing that for um, uh, about 14 years. Um, yeah, I started uh, writing songs, um, trying to make, well, uh, Britain was the aim, uh, a bit more left-wing, and then, you know, the wider world, I've been going through 
doing that for 14 years, writing my folk songs, trying to make the, the world more left-wing. And, uh, and I think, uh, if anything... <laughs> made things quite a lot worse, haven't they? <laughs> but we persevere, don't we? Hey? It's funny, when I started doing this, with, in, we had David Cameron as the Prime Minister when I started doing this, and I thought, fucking hell, he sucks. <laughs> I'll write some songs and get rid of him. And I did. And then he was replaced by Theresa May, and I thought, what the fuck have I done? <laughs> So I thought I'd write some more songs, get rid of her. She was replaced by Boris Johnson. <laughs> and I thought, well, it can't get any worse than that. <laughs> so, uh, so I wrote some more songs, got rid of Boris Johnson, and then I didn't get a chance to write any songs about Liz Truss. So. <laughs> wasn't quick enough off the mark there. <laughs> but I've got a new uh, record of, of protest songs that uh, is just out and uh, I always try and do, when I do Guilty Feminist shows I try and do, uh, which it's an honour to be asked back by, by Deborah and to be a part of this once again, honestly it's m one of my favourite things I've ever done. And, uh, and I try and sort of sing a song that's kind of relevant to, to something that's been talked about. And, uh, and I like that Michelle was talking about social media and the big distraction that it offers from the kind of serious things that are going on in the world. So I wrote a song about that. It's extraordinarily depressing. <laughs> you, you wouldn't believe it. Even though I've warned you, you're going to be like, fuck me. By the end. Um, so what I'm going to do is then I'm going to do one that's quite happy. All right, is that a deal? So this is the uh, this is the depressing one. It's called Next Episode Starts. I guess it's. Get a shrink. Get a gin. Pick yourself a god and get right with him. And lie awake and watch the landscape lightening Till one more time you've waited out the dark Scream your rage to the abyss Does social really seem like the right word for this? A hundred pixelated hearts and thumbs up fists Say you're right to feel as empty as you are Is anyone alive out there? Am I getting through to you? The next episode starts in four, three, two. Maybe it's you, or maybe it's a functioning reaction to apocalypse. Does illness really feel like the right word for this? This feeling that things shouldn't be this way. So turn your head and look away. Cause suffering and pain, they happen every day. But if any of your plates drop, they'll be held to pay. So find a way to make it through the day But for a second there Thought I was getting through to you The next episode starts In four, three, two Things to be okay. I just can't see how they will be. 
You say we must keep on the lie I think that's what's gonna kill me The times you wish you didn't care If caring this much might just break you You could never be Who not caring would make you So tell yourself that come the door You're gonna start again the next episode starts in five, four, three, two. Thank you. I know, right? <laughs> You're like, Jesus Christ. Comedy podcast, fucking hell. <laughs> but it's going to be all right, because like I said, I've got another song. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a folk singer, so I, I have sort of um, two types of songs. I have sad and angry. Um, <laughs> and then I have one happy song. Um, so we like to get it out of the way nice and early in the show. Um, and the reason I have a happy song is because something happened to me that I had to write a happy song about, which is that um, uh, I became an auntie. Um, and uh, and actually, it's actually ten years ago now. Um, ten years ago, I became an auntie, and uh, I was at Glastonbury Festival in the UK. Anyone here been to Glastonbury? Yeah, yeah? cool. So um, so you'll know uh, that uh, the the pyramid stage uh, at Glastonbury. That's like the big main stage where Ed Sheeran and Adele and all those people play. Um, that's the main stage, and uh, Glastonbury is. Um, it's about five hours away um, from where I am from in the UK. I'm from a place called Leicester. And, uh... gosh, you know what? It's genuinely, I don't know how, I don't know how you guys are, but it is fucking freezing up here. Right? <laughs> Absolutely freezing, right? Um, so much so that my guitar keeps losing its tuning. Um, so much so that I put on this cardigan. <laughs> which I exclusively use for flying. <laughs> like, it's not a fashion statement. <laughs> but I was in the wings and I'm like, I've got to bring out the fucking cardigan. Do you know what I mean? That's where we're at anyway. Um, so, uh, so I was, I, was, uh, I was at Glastonbury and my sister was nine months pregnant, so we knew that she could go into labour any time at all. And, uh, and I got this phone call on the Sunday night at the festival um, telling me that it was, it was D-Day. And so I got in the car and I drove home and I wrote this song about my niece being born. And I thought I would sing it because of Michelle's lovely story about um, making it back in time for the birth. And that didn't happen for me. My niece didn't wait for me to be born. Um, didn't wait for me to be born? Jesus Christ. <laughs> the wheels are really fucking coming off up here, aren't they? Um, yeah, my sister was in labour for 45 hours. Um, yeah, so uh, I, don't think, I don't think it was neither here nor there to her where I was at that point. Um, but anyway, I wrote this song um, about that and my niece's name is Ivy and this song too is called Ivy and uh, I'm going to play this one and then we're going to send you right on into the interval. Um, so uh, we'll see you in the second half because this. Some other things I should tell you about this song. Um, any fans of the band Kiss Sabian? Yeah, you're not going to like this. Um, if you don't know Kiss Sabian, they are a British rock band that I don't myself uh, particularly rate. Um, uh, the M5 is a motorway. And that's about all you need to know, I think. That's all the translation is. It was Glastonbury 2014 And me and my best friend We'd had an awesome festival Then we got a call on Sunday about half past ten And it was back to the camp and it was pack up the ten And it was saying goodbye to Billy Bragg as we went And telling our friends that we had somewhere to be Someone so much more important 
And all those VIPs, it was your mum on the phone that rerouted us. We got a hug, goodbye from Phil, stupid sus. And then we drove all night from Glastonbury to meet you home when you were ready to arrive, Ivy. And I drove until the sun came up to be you home all the way up the M5, Ivy. So that was the first half. Join us for part two, which should be in your feed right now.